This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. It's great to be back with you again to continue our study of Lesson 1 on the authority and inspiration of the Bible. My name is Charlie De Palma. You're welcome to be with us in this class in our study of the Word of God. We want to remind you of the memory verse that we assigned last time, Matthew 17, 5. Hope you've worked on that and have that committed to your memory and ask you to take down the memory verse for the next class, Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew 24, verse 35. We're talking about in this section of our study reasons for believing that the Bible is the Word of God. Last time we saw that the amazing unity of the Bible is a good reason for believing that it is the Word of God. Today we'd like to continue with that thought by looking at a second among many reasons why we believe the Bible is the Word of God and that is its accurate fulfillment of prophecy hundreds of years after those prophecies were recorded in the Bible. Accurate fulfillment of prophecy hundreds of years after the prophecies were recorded in the Bible. Men have never been able to do this. They have never been able to look into the future hundreds of years down the stream of time and say exactly, precisely what was going to happen. We're not talking about guesses of what it looks like things will happen because all the facts go together. We're talking about precise, detailed, remarkable things that some would never predict would happen. That's what we see in the Bible. And that is a sure indication that God is the author of the Bible, not any men. For example, some have counted 456 Old Testament pop, uh, prophecies referring to Jesus the Christ and His kingdom before He ever came to this earth. We'd like for you to consider with us several examples, and these are only several of the many, many hundreds that we could look at. First of, first of all, <clears throat> we have the first promise of the Messiah, or the first messianic promise. And that is found in the Old Testament in the very first book, Genesis 3, verse 15. God promised that the seed of woman would crush the head of the, of the seed of Satan, or crush Satan's head. The first promise of a Savior, a Messiah. And that is fulfilled in the New Testament in Galatians 4, verse 4. A second prophecy that the Messiah would be born of the tribe of Judah, one of the children of Jacob or Israel, found in the Old Testament in Genesis 49, verse 10, fulfilled in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5. Another remarkable prophecy that the Savior would be born of a virgin, found in, old, in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. That never had been done before and never has been done again. Only through the miraculous work of God could Jesus be born of a virgin, and it was predicted some 700 years before he came to earth. Another prophecy, that he would be born in Bethlehem. Even the place of his birth was predicted in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, a remarkable passage that talks about one coming out of Bethlehem who would be the ruler in Israel, whose going force had been from everlasting. So an eternal one would come to be ruler in Israel and be born in Bethlehem, fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Another one, that he would be acquainted with sorrow, despised, and rejected, 
found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2 and verse 3, and fulfilled in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 27, verse 30 and verse 31. And we'd like to read those two verses from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2 and 3. And please, as we read these, keep in your mind that God recorded them through His prophet Isaiah some 700 years before the Lord Jesus stepped foot, set foot on this earth. Isaiah 53 is one of the most remarkable prophecies recorded in the Bible, and it is a living testimony that this book is from God and not from any man. Isaiah 53, verse 2 and 3. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Now, if you are going to predict a Savior, one who is going to be a ruler, would you predict someone that was going to be not attractive from the physical standpoint, one that is not desirable from the physical standpoint? Would you predict one who is going to be despised and rejected by men, hated, afflicted by men, those who he came to seek and save? I wouldn't do that. No man would do that. But God would, and God did. And this remarkable prophecy was fulfilled exactly and precisely by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at another one concerning the Lord found in Isaiah chapter 53. It said that he would bear the sins of others. And again, keep in mind, this was recorded 700 years before he came to this earth. This is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 11, and fulfilled in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 27, of verse 30 and 31, and you might also make a record of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And I'd like to read these verses also from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 and 6, and then verse 11. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then in verse 11, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What a remarkable prophecy. And can you see how that was fulfilled when Jesus came to this earth? That Israel rejected him, despised him, hated him, put him to a criminal's death, and he bore in his own body our sins so that we might be forgiven of those sins? That's amazing. No man could record this kind of material hundreds of years before it happened. Only God could do that. And this is further testimony that the Bible is the Word of God just as God claims it is in the sacred pages of this sacred volume. Then let's go and look at another remarkable prophecy. This one is that the, the Savior 
would be betrayed by a friend. Betrayed by a friend. You wouldn't predict that kind of thing either. But that's found in the Old Testament in Psalm 41 verse 9, fulfilled in the New Testament in John 13 verse 18. And then another, that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Even the exact amount, the exact price of his betrayal was predict predicted by God in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 and verse 13, fulfilled in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. These are amazing prophecies. And to get the full effect of these, just these few prophecies, we'd like to look at another chart summarizing the major points we've seen in these prophecies. And please keep in mind that these are just eight of the hundreds of prophecies concerning the Lord and allow the impact of these prophecies to soak in and affect your mind. We have the first promise of the Messiah in Genesis 3, the first book of the Bible. We have that he would be born of a tribe of the tribe of Judah in the nation of Israel. Not only that, but that he would be born of a virgin, something which never happened before and never has happened since. That even the city of his birth was predicted that he would be born in Bethlehem. That he would be despised and rejected by men acquainted with sorrows, rejected by those he came to seek and to save. That he would bear the sins of others in his own body, that those may be forgiven by the blood that he would shed. That he would be betrayed by a familiar friend, one whom he knew, one who he dipped bread with, and that even his betrayal price was predicted 30 pieces of silver. I submit to you that such prophecies given hundreds of years in advance are a startling and remarkable confirmation that the Bible is the word of God, not the word of men. So we've seen now two reasons other than the Bible's own testimony for believing that the Bible is the word of God. It's amazing unity and the remarkable, astounding fulfillment of accurate, precise, detailed prophecies hundreds of years after they were recorded in the Bible. Now let's look at a third reason for believing the Bible is the Word of God, and that is its impartiality. When we look at books by human authors, they usually either build up the good of the hero or they emphasize the evil of the villain, the one who is the bad person in the story. They seldom include both. Their purpose is usually to do one or the other. But contrast that with the Bible. Take, for example, several characters. Noah, God says that he was a preacher of righteousness, but yet it was shown that he was drunk. He was a human being. He made a mistake. He sinned against God. David, David is described as a man after God's own heart, and yet David committed adultery and participated in the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Abraham, what a man of great faith who went out on faith and went to a land he didn't know where he was going, left his family behind. And yet the Bible also records the fa fact that he lied to Pharaoh. And then there's Peter. What great energy and enthusiasm and faith in the Lord. And yet Peter tragically denied the Lord three times as Jesus predicted he would. So what do we conclude? The Bible's author was a human or divine? We conclude that he was divine. God tells all the truth. The good about the heroes and their evil, the sins that they committed, he's impartial. He recorded the information as it actually occurred. A fourth reason for believing that the Bible is the Word of God is its indestructibility. That is, it cannot be destroyed. 
despite attempts to destroy it through the years. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, our memory verse for next class, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. In other words, before the world is destroyed, even until the world is destroyed and after it is destroyed, God's word will not be destroyed. It is indestructible. Think about some attempts to destroy the Bible through history. We can go to the Old Testament, to the book of Jeremiah, in the 36th chapter. There we read about King Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah, living during the time of Jeremiah. And in verses 22 and following of that chapter, Jehoiakim took his penknife and he cut the scroll of God, cut it up, and he took that scroll containing the words of God and threw it into the fire, assuming that he had destroyed the word of God and he didn't have to worry about it anymore. But what do we learn? In verse 32, we learn that God had Jeremiah re rewrite those words and add more words to it, warnings and rebukes against people like Jehoiakim who would try to tamper with and destroy the Word of God. He wasn't successful. Nobody else has been either. A second example is the group known as the Roman Catholic Church. Now before we make these comments, we want to make, make sure that you understand that we are not approaching this from the standpoint of hatred or arrogance or, or an attempt to be unkind in any way. We love all people. We want people to be happy in this life and spend eternity in heaven. But God commands that we speak the truth and to do that in a spirit of love for Him and people, Ephesians 4.15. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to speak the truth recording the facts of history. That's all we're going to do. In 1184, Pope Lucius III excommunicated the Waldenses, the Waldenses, that is, he threw them out of the church, if you will, cast them out of the church. Well, why did he do that? What horrible crime had they committed? They said that the Bible was central to their worship. In other words, they wanted to worship according to the Bible, not according to the doctrines and commandments of men. But the Catholic Church excommunicated them because of that attitude. That's an attempt to harm the influence of the Bible. In 1229, a group of high Roman Catholic officials in Toulouse, France, forbade the people to have the scriptures. They said they couldn't have the scriptures. That's from the religious group that claims to have given us the Bible. That's an attempt to destroy the influence of the Bible. During the Reformation period in the 15 and 1600s, John Huss is quoted as saying, the Bible, not the church, is the Christian's sole authority. So he was saying, don't go to the church to find out what your authority is or isn't. You go to the Bible, to the Word of God. That's a great attitude. That's the kind of attitude that God uh, is pleased with and blesses. His Bibles and books were burned by the Roman Catholic Church. That didn't stop John Huss. He was a courageous fellow who loved the Lord and loved the Bible as his word. Then those Catholic officials buried him alive. Now that's an attempt to hurt, destroy the Bible and its influence upon men. Then one other concerning the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that, this is entitled, The Cardinal's Advice. Because of the remarkable words contained therein, we will bring them up on a screen for you to read as we read with you the Cardinal's advice. Here is what some religious leaders in the Roman Catholic Church said to one of the popes. Quote, Of all the counseling 
we can possibly give to your holiness, we reserve the most important of it to the last. We must hold our eyes well open and intervene with all of our power in the affairs we have to consider. The reading of the gospel must be permitted as little as possible. Notice that. The reading of the gospel must be permitted as little as possible, especially in the modern languages and in the countries under your authority. The very little that is read generally at the Mass should be enough. The very little that is read at the Mass should be enough. And it should be prohibited for anyone to read more. In other words, people should be forbidden to read any more than is read at the Mass. As long as the people are content with that small part, our interests will prosper. Notice that. Here's a religious group who believed that people had to be deprived of the Bible for their interests to prosper. But he said, they went on to say, but from the moment that the people desire to read more, our interests will begin to suffer. Here is the book that more than any other provoked rebellions against us, storms that have been risky in bringing us loss. In fact, if anyone reads accurately the teaching of the Bible and compares what occur occurs in our churches, he will soon find out the contradictions. Can you imagine such a statement? If the people are allowed to read the Bible and compare what God said in the Bible with what the Roman Catholic Church was doing then and today, they'll find out the contradictions. And we'll see that our teaching is far, from, far removed from that of the Bible and more often is in opposition to it. If the people realize this, they will provoke us without rest until all become unveiled and then we will become the object of ridicule and universal hate. It is necessary <coughs> excuse me, that the Bible be taken away and snatched from the hands of the people. However, with much wisdom in order to not provoke trouble. There's a, a remarkable statement, and that statement was made by the cardinals, the royal or, or high Roman Catholic officials, to Pope Jules of Rome in 1550, and it's found in the National Bibliothèque or the National Library in Paris, France. The volume is reserve number 22719, pages 101 and 102. This is not some story made up by those who are hostile to this particular religious group. This is a fact of history. Those people determined to destroy the Bible and the influence the Bible had upon the people. But they weren't successful just as no others have ever been successful in that effort. Another example, Voltaire, who was a famous French writer and philosopher who lived from 1694 to 1778. Voltaire said, in 100 years, there won't be one Bible left. That's a remarkable statement. Sounds like he thought that his philosophy his thinking was going to replace that of God's and His Word. But you know what happened? 200 years later, His work sold in Paris for 11 cents, and the British government paid $500,000 for a New Testament manuscript. And after Voltaire's death, his printing press, which he used to print his material, Guess what it was used to print? You're right, Bibles. And his house was used to
to store Bibles by the Geneva Bible Society. Voltaire was wrong. He was tragically wrong. He was wrong in that he tried to destroy the Bible and its influence upon the lives of men. All attempts have failed. We still have this wonderful volume, the Word of God, despite the attempts by men to destroy it. That tells us that God is behind it. He is protecting it. There is no book in the history of man that has more conclusive manuscript and other evidence than the Bible. There's a reason for that. It's God's Word, and He's protected it, and we can thank Him for that. So that's another reason for knowing the Bible is the Word of God. A fifth reason is there is a higher code of conduct. There is a higher standard of living given to us in the Bible by God. Let me just give you a few examples. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 44, Love your enemies. Now, does that sound like the advice of men? Is that what men say? To love your enemies? He said, Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That's not men's wisdom to, uh, speaking. That's God. This is of a higher plane than the advice that men give. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Man says you need to satisfy your desires, your lusts. Whatever you want, you need to do. And certainly don't take up a cross. A cross is an instrument of punishment, of suffering, of humiliation. But Jesus said that. And he said, follow me. Where did he go? He went to that cross. And he died that death for you and for me. That's not the advice of men. That's God speaking through his son, Jesus. The apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Is that what man says? You seek the spiritual things, heavenly things, do what God says? That's not what man says. Man says, do what you want to do. Do what makes you happy. This is obviously advice and levels of living and conduct that comes from God, not from man. James said in James 1 verse 2, Count it all joy, my beloved brethren, when you fall into manifold trials. Man doesn't tell us to rejoice in the trials that we experience in this life, but God does. All of these things and other statements show us that there is a higher level of conduct, of ethics, of behavior in the Bible. The Bible came from God. Men say, if it feels good, do it. Men say, take care of yourself. Don't worry about anybody else. They say, grab all of the physical pleasure you can because you only live life once. Those are the advice of men. But the Bible didn't come from men. The Bible came from God. It is the Word of God, and it prescribes a higher code of living. Now, those are just five of the reasons that we have for believing that the Bible is the Word of God. There are many more. It's historical accuracy. It's scientific accuracy and uh, prediction of things that scientists or humans didn't know hundreds of years before it was known by men, uh, its influence upon people throughout the ages. Many great men have recognized that the Bible was a tremendously important influence in their life and their leaders from different countries who have testified to that. Many other reasons, but these are sufficient for us to know this Bible is from God. It's His Word. Let's briefly go summarize those reasons that we've seen and studied here for believing the Bible is the Word of God. First of all, it's amazing unity. 
Secondly, its fulfillment of prophecy. Third, its impartiality. Fourth, it cannot be destroyed despite the attempts by men to do that. And fifth, its higher code of conduct, of, of uh, standard of living, of ethics, of morality. And that brings us to the fourth major point in our study on the subject of the authority and inspiration of the Bible, and that is what alternatives are there to accepting the Bible as the standard of authority? Are there alternatives? Yes, there are. There are alternatives, and we want to study some about what God says about those alternatives. Let's just look at several. One is the traditions and customs of men. Traditions and customs of men. Just look out into the denominational world today. Ask them for a biblical reason for many of their customs and traditions. They can't give them because there are none. There are no biblical reasons for them. Let me give you a couple of examples. Infant baptism, practiced widely in the religious world. The baptizing of babies. That's never found in the New Testament of Christ or the Old Testament. It's not authorized by the Word of God. Babies can't meet the conditions that must be met before one is baptized, and yet it happens. That's a tradition and custom of man. What about the Lord's Supper? Some practice it uh, or uh, follow the Lord's Supper once a month, some once a quarter, some once a year. But the Bible says, do it every first day of the week. We'll study that in a future lesson, Lord willing. So there's the difference. There's the traditions of men and the customs of men and the Word of God. What about the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship of God? The Bible says, sing. Every verse in the New Testament that refers to our music and worship of God says, sing. That's all we have authority to God, from God to do. And we cannot add the mechanical instrument of music without sinning against God. So men have their customs and traditions, but the Bible says differently. We need to compare what men are doing today where they can't justify what they're doing from the Bible with the attitude of the Bereans that we referred to earlier. In Acts 17 verse 11, they searched the scriptures daily to determine whether those things were so. They knew the standard of authority is the Bible not the traditions and customs of men. So they went to the Bible to find out what they could and couldn't do. Well, what was Jesus' attitude toward the traditions and customs of men? Let's go to a passage of Scripture where, we'll, where we will see that very clearly. This is found in Mark, the seventh chapter, verses 7 through 9. Mark 7, verses 7 through 9. Jesus said, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. That's a frightening passage of Scripture. The Lord told those people, and us today, when we worship according to the doctrines and commandments of men, our worship is vain. It's of no value. It's of, of no use to us nor to the Lord. That's frightening and serious and sobering. But let's look at the Apostle Paul's attitude towards the traditions and customs of men. This is found in the book of Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He said by God's inspiration, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So Paul said, You be careful. Be on guard. 
Beware of men who come to you with their wise words, philosophy, and their deceit, and their traditions and customs, because they can rob you of your eternal reward. And that's serious. What about the Apostle Peter? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, we see his attitude towards the customs and traditions of men. He said, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So Peter said that these people had lived before their conversion by their aimless, vain conduct, and it was governed by the traditions that they received from their fathers. What is the conclusion that we can draw from these and other passages of Scripture on this subject? God doesn't accept the customs and traditions of men as the standard of authority whenever they conflict with His standard, His Word. So we can't use that as an acceptable standard of authority. A second uh, alternative to the Word of God is man's common sense or reasoning power. Common sense or reasoning power. Now, God has given us a mind to think and to use in such a way that we can reason. So we're not arguing against the use of common sense or reasoning power. What we're saying is, should we use that as our standard of authority? Should we use our common sense and our reasoning power as our sole standard of authority. And Lord willing, we will continue our study of that subject. We will answer that question by going to our safe standard, the Word of God. Until we're able to do that, we encourage you to continue studying your notes, working on your memory verse, Matthew 24, 35, and going about doing good, following the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.